All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode. Chris Lopez here. And today you are listening or watching to the fourth episode in our seven part series on Elevate Your Flip here in Denver. So if you've not listened to the previous three episodes, I definitely recommend you check those out at some point. Luckily, you don't need to listen to those three to follow along with this episode and the next couple. In my mind, uh, the first three really go together. They help you build your foundation, then talk analyzing deals, then about finding deals. And that's all kind of like they go together in my mind. Now, this episode with the next few episodes really goes into what do you do once you have a deal under contract and you're starting the flipping process and the magic to that i shouldn't say mad the magic for that but the important thing of that is project management and that's exactly what we're talking about today with our guest host again derek marlin derek how are you i'm good chris thanks for having me and so it's really good to have you back and i mean you know you and i have talked a lot offline about just investing in general and the process here because mm -hmm. we are both i'll say process oriented people yeah. um may, we make our checklist we refine our checklist and that allows you to scale it allows you to not lay awake at 2 a.m worrying about too many details right. it allows you to you know uh bring other people on board and really create a well-oiled machine and that's one of the things I really liked about the process you have. I wanted the series with you because you are extremely organized when it comes to uh, the project management side of it. I've seen your folders, you. I've seen your checklist, <laughs> and they are Thank very you. impressive. Thank you. And I like that. And in a nutshell, that's what we're talking about. So yeah. the big four property management. And I actually, where do you want to start with this? Because I know you've got four areas you talk about, but right. where do you even start with this? Because this is it's a meaty topic but it is so important. Yeah, it is. And and I think you framed it perfectly that you can gain a lot of knowledge from the first three. You can listen to them as standalone, but I do think it helps to group that together. The next two would be a good um, series to group together, episode four and five, because there's so much between our big four of project management, which are the budget, the statement of work, the fixture and finish package, which is how you're finishing your property, and then the timeline and tracker that we thought about splitting it up into two episodes. And um, so these would be good to listen to together. And then you could also go back to six and seven as more of a, a standalone um, listen if you needed to versus the whole series at once. Great. Yep. Um, so to kind of help me and I think our listeners out there kind of conceptually get on the same page as mm -hmm. you, uh, at this point in the overall process, we've we found, you know, we've gone through our sifting and sorting. Yep. We found the deal that numbers make sense. Yep. We put our offer in. We're under contract. Yep. Roll off dumpsters there. Yep. And then we start project management. Is that kind of like the big overview as to where we're at? Yeah, it definitely is. And we really try probably 80% of our projects. We are still, um, we are committed to moving forward, but we actually have not purchased the property yet. So we'll, we are building our budget and our statement of work pre-purchase okay, and um, also doing fixtures and finishes and the timeline and tracker, ideally pre-purchase. Um, so oh, when you say pre-purchase, is that pre-contract or pre-closing? Pre-closing. So you're under contract. Correct. You're like, hey, we think we got the numbers that yep. we want. Now let's get all the details yep. to make sure everything lines up and we're going to go forward with closing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Because I think a lot of people when they run their flips, they you know, find their way to evaluate if it's a good deal they close on the project and they say, okay, now it's time to get to work. For us, that one or two weeks before we close on a project, when we are under contract and know we are committed to moving forward is insanely busy because we do a ton of work on these big four of project management documents to make sure that everything is teed up so that the second we do close, we can literally start and hit the ground running, ideally the next day. Um, many times we might be renting back to a client other scenarios that go on, but the perfect scenario is, is we are under contract. We've done all this planning that we're about to talk about in the next two episodes. We close and we start day one rather than, okay, now it's time to start because you never inherently lose a week or two minimum with carrying costs. People are, you know, giving away five to 800 bucks a week. Yeah. Your um, daily burn, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just in, in carrying cost and your daily burn. So it's important. And I, I just want to really stress that because I think no matter what, especially for a flip, but really just, you know, business and investing in general, anything you do, the more preparation you do yeah. and the better you can hit the ground running on, you know, day zero or day one, every way you calculate it. I mean, the more money you make. I mean, that's yep. the bottom line is the more money and the less stress you have. Yep. Because one of my pet peeves is running around like crazy 
if it's organized and things are checked off and I've done the 10 things before. So number 11 is lined up. Well, yep. I'm a lot less stressful and therefore yep. happier. And I usually make more money that way. And I find most people are the same way. Yeah. Or they want to be the same way, I should say. No, a hundred percent. It's super, super important. And really the days that you can save yourself planning up front will not only save you a week or two in the actual project, but think of it this way. If you're coming down the finish line and you've saved yourself a week or two and you're leading into a holiday week when it's not good to list a property when it's fixed up. You might eat another week on the back end, uh, maybe two weeks on the back end. Then you start to get into a little bit slower seasonal time to sell a property. So it, it literally can save you a couple thousand dollars minimum to you know the low tens of thousands of dollars by not wasting time up front, but then also getting burned with time on the back end leading into holidays. Great. All right. So we sifted, we sorted, yep. we have found the property Yep. and regardless of what source it came from, it's under contract. Yep. Um, so let's just say I got this property under contract today. Yep. Um, what am I doing? You're, or what are we doing? Right yeah. Now? Yeah. So from our prior episode, we did talk about how do we estimate the rehab by looking at photos if it's an MLS type property or having questions for our buyers if it's an off market property. So again, we've we've made sure that the numbers work if everything that that the seller tells us is is correct. Um, this is more when you're physically getting in the project and going over a quick budgeting sheet. And by quick, I mean um, I try to look back and see what would be the average amount of time we spend in a property before closing. And it would be for an off market deal, uh, when you're looking at that property, you're usually get about an hour to inspect the property. Um, you can try to look for more time, but sometimes the sellers have other things going on in their lives and, and you kind of get that hour. If it's a property that's on the MLS, we definitely can take a, about two hours to really refine our numbers and inspect and put together our budget. So we'll jump to this budgeting document here in a second. It's an Excel spreadsheet that we use for every project, whether it's a uh, more cosmetic condo in a townhome. We are typically not doing structural things, this also works really well for a single family residential flip where you might be fixing every major system and spending, you know, six figures on the flip too. So we'll jump into this document here in a second on how do you budget and get, we feel like we get within about 95% effectiveness of what the budget actually is before you close on the project, start demo, and then usually 5% always comes back up of what you open up the walls to see, but we really feel like we can hit the ground running and be okay. super close. Great. Yep. Um, so really this, this is a checklist you're using in that one to two hour window you have while yep. you're uh, estimating everything. Yep. Okay. So it's typically done with a probably a couple of days going after contract, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So we got this, we're going to go, you know, physically or not physically, yeah, virtually go walk virtually. this property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then use a spreadsheet. Okay. And yep. that's how we build out the budget, the project management, all that stuff. Yep. Gotcha. Correct. And then we'll jump into the statement of work. Um, we're going to go through a separate document that is a statement of work or SOW, as we call it, for a condo or a townhome. Um, we'll get into another statement of work for single family property. And the difference between the two, as far as elevation is concerned, is the condo and townhome, it's geared towards a level of contractor that's going to be doing a lot of the work themselves. Um, not too tremendously much is going to be subbed out and we've consolidated it so that you have the, uh, the, the dollar amount and the budget and the statement of work of what's going on in the project on one sheet. When we jump to a whole home rehab, the statement of work is actually a spreadsheet that has a separate tab for every individual room because you've got a lot of different things going on on a room by room basis versus a condo and a townhome, which we'll demonstrate in this episode is a little bit more succinct for the statement of work. And probably with the homes, that's where you have, you're probably bringing in a, a bigger GC or more subs because yes. there's just, there's more mechanicals or sewer yep. pipes, there's roofs, there's just more moving parts that yep. you as the owner are responsible for, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's exactly right. And for us, we typically make that delineation between GC or general contractor person who's able to pull licenses, who is using typically quite a few more subcontractors and kind of managing the overall process that individual is not typically doing as much physical work themselves. Sometimes you have GCs that do some of the work themselves, but many times they're managing multiple projects versus condos and townhomes lend themselves to our kind of term as contractor person who may or may not be able to pull permits or have a license 
they are the person doing a large amount of the work themselves. Um, they might sub out electrical, sometimes plumbing, but really it's just a matter of them doing a lot of the work themselves. So we, we used to use the more involved version and it was almost too much. Mm. So you can be ultra organized, but after a while, if, if it's a tool that a person's not really going to use, you got to kind of also, um, without, you know, giving up your standards, but kind of play to your contractor's strengths instead of force feeding them the, the way that we do things. So we've evolved over time into these two versions. Cool. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. And uh, cool. Let's jump into it. Yeah. So let's go. Um, we'll change to the quick rehab budget document. So we'll get out of our slides. Yeah. Is perfect. That yep. this one? That's it. All right. Let me get up here on the screen. And so I know a lot of the people are, are listening to this on the podcast. Um, so you guys can definitely check out the video to see this uh, and also uh, for some screenshots. Now, I know this question will come up, so we'll get mm -hmm. out of the way. Is this available for people to download or should they email you or is this a, a secret sauce for you and your clients? No, this isn't secret sauce necessarily. So we will definitely be posting this. We'd love to kind of help people walk through it because there is a little bit of, of nuance and how to interpret which budget amount you are selecting. So a lot of ours, again, this was refined from the last six years of inspecting, you know, hundreds of properties. And and we we almost overthought it early on and came back to a small, medium, and large budget amount for different aspects of the house. So when we're looking at this document from a, a 30,000 foot perspective, the columns on the left side of the document are more, think of it as, again, you're walking through a home and what budget items can you circle to help develop your budget? The items on the right are more things that are a tally mark. Um, so for example, and we'll go through it here in more detail, but number of windows, we've got prices allocated to certain size mm -hmm. windows and we're just doing tally marks for how many windows versus instead of counting every individual kitchen cabinet box, um, which we still wanna make sure and do, we are estimating how much is it gonna cost us to do a small kitchen as far as the cabinets and the install, a medium kitchen or a large kitchen versus you can be more spot on and it's just as time efficient to tally mark the number of windows you're putting in a project, the number of doors, lighting, things of that nature. So just from a big picture perspective, again, you're working with one to two hours. It worked better for us instead of just taking these copious notes is going through and circling different aspects of where you're going to be spending your rehab money. At the end of the day, you then go back to your office or your home, tally up your total dollar amount. Um, take We usually always take pictures of every room in the house and we take a video to double check to make sure we didn't miss anything. And that should get you again about 95% there as far as firming up your budget um, when you're getting ready to select which contract you want to use. All right. So what's the best way to go? Do we, should we just zoom in on one section here and talk about that to move around? Yeah, I think that would be perfect. I think what we'll do is um, we broke it up into, into a couple different areas. Overall, along the left-hand side, and always just trying to think of somebody listening to this in their car, is you're going over more of the rooms of the home. So you've got kitchens, you've got master bedroom, you've got uh, additional bathrooms. Doesn't really matter where they are in this style of budgeting. And then you've got number of bedrooms and extra living spaces. So um, additional spots for notes. So roughly, you know, 65% of the overall one page, it gives you the ability to circle a dollar amount of what it's gonna cost you to rehab based on a small, medium or large, which we'll kind of define here in a minute. And then tally marks on um, quantities of rehab items that you're putting in, in addition to major systems. So windows, doors, garage door, lighting, paint, toilet, drywall. Yep. And we'll go through some more detail, but just to yeah. describe it. Great. Okay, yeah, so, so that kind of looks at it from a, a, a top-down perspective. So if we dive into the kitchen, we've broken it up into um, essentially five different areas. I used to circle and budget based on an entire kitchen might cost you anywhere from ten to $20,000, but we found there was a big variance and really an error on our part of what our budgeting was. And we were being conservative in our offers of what we were writing. And we were probably missing out on a couple of deals that I think we probably could have gotten mm -hmm. had we sharpened our pencil and really narrowed in on our numbers. So that's where this evolution of this document came from. So for kitchen cabinets, 
and the installation price, we go back to that small, medium, and large price point. Um, we've got dollar amounts budgeted of $5,000 for a small kitchen remodel, um, again, specifically for the cost of cabinets and your install, $6,000 for medium, and $8,000 for large. And the small, medium, and large in homes typically is small for all of your different categories is more of your condo, your townhome, your properties that are under a thousand square feet. Your medium starts to lean towards either a large townhome or a smaller single family home. So around 1,500 to 2,000 square feet. Large is think of your more suburban single family home of your 2,500 square feet and above. That's kind of your break point of how am I deciding small, medium, and large. Um, and then when you talk about being able to download this versus let's say talk to us of how to kind of use this tool, good example would be is, is you might be in a a medium size or a you know single family home that's 1500 square feet but it actually has a huge kitchen you would actually then go in and circle some of the large budget amounts mm -hmm. to compensate for that or even vice versa we've been in um, done a couple of townhomes that are close to 2000 square feet but the kitchen footprint is really not very large so we've actually been more on the small side as far as uh, our budget items okay all right, so going through this th first thing, we are virtually walking around this kitchen here, yep. and we would just say determine small, medium, large, and we will circle one. Yep. Take photos, take a video, mm -hmm. but circle one just kind of give us a, a ballpark estimate. Correct. Then we look at countertops. Yep. Look at countertops. Going back to that small, medium, and large, we've got budget amounts from two thousand to four thousand dollars. Um, kind of our current market conditions are such that the price of quartz has dropped relative to granite. So actually we are putting quartz in most of our projects, mm. even if it is a condo, um, that bang for the buck and that return on your sales price point has definitely justified doing quartz. So we don't do granite as much anymore. Um, we also then want to separate backsplash, not only for amount of square feet, but you can really spend a lot more money on the quality of your backsplash. So we have 20 feet, 30 feet, and 40 square feet of backsplash. So you're just taking a tape measure and mm -hmm. estimating yep. the rough square footage of this. Yep, exactly. Okay. Estimating the rough square footage. So you're going to spend an extra $500 to $1,000 to add backsplash on top of it. And for the uh, start on to the, the countertops, the, mm -hmm. the small condos, 2000 Standards three thousand, largest four thousand. Correct. Uh, just to read off the numbers for people who are listening to this. Yeah, and I think some people at home are probably thinking that that might seem a little bit low. The nice thing is, is this is a refinement of us having great relationships and essentially wholesale type of pricing with contractors for doing volume. It's something that we can kind of help extend it to our clients that we work with. Um, and then also we're really, really big sticklers about not over improving. So you can, you know, go in and feel like, oh, I've got a, a nice house in, you know, Arvada or Littleton. That's a great suburban area. Uh, let's put in, you know, $7,000 countertops and you're not going to get that return. So you really need in my mind to help justify why are we spending more than that? Because you're really not going to get the return for countertops, uh, really just for any, any aspect of the yep. overall flip. Um, so we talked about countertops, talked about backsplash. Another area that we are doing in almost every property is opening a kitchen wall of some sort. So you have the open concept, no matter what the price point is. So we've broken that one up into there's no load, um, which is a structural term, meaning you don't have to reinforce what you're taking out. It is a wall that's typically a couple feet in length and back in the day was built so that you had separation from a, let's say, dining room to a kitchen. You're going to want to take that out. Small, so that's a $500 expense. Taking out a smaller wall, um, again, not structural bearing, but you're, you're doing more work to take it out and also put up new drywall and do some finish work. So you're at the thousand dollar price point. And then the large would typically include some sort of load bearing amount of work that you'd have to do and putting in a structural beam to open up that wall. And so that's a $1,500 expense. And usually that's more of a, a whole wall that's truly dividing dining room or living room from the kitchen. And we've got that. So you're 500 to $1,500 in extra expense for opening up a kitchen wall and, and doing the finish work needed. Okay. And then <clears throat> looking at appliances um, next. Yep. So then the last section would be appliances and then your fixture and finishes, which would be the faucet for your kitchen sink, mm. the handful of lights that go in a kitchen. 
um, the hardware that you're putting on and the knobs for your cabinetry, any little thing that you're putting in to kind of finish the space out. This is a, an overall catch all. Uh, go back to the small, medium, and, and large. Um, we've broken this up a little bit in that small, again, is more the condo style of, of property. Um, standard would be just your traditional level of appliances. Don't need to go over the top. Just needs to be stainless steel, needs to be new, needs to be you know a recognizable brand. Um, and then usually we find that over a $500,000 sales price point, buyers, and rightfully so, you're spending a half a million dollars on a home, it starts to matter what brand you might need. Um, you're typically needing to put in, um, let's say, a range that has a downdraft and um, is a little bit more expensive product. You might want to maximize kitchen space and do a fridge that is counter depth instead of standard depth. And so that's more expensive. Okay. So your appliances and your fixtures and finishes are ranging normally from about $3,000 on the smaller end to $5,000 on the large end and same thing, you know, unless you're doing a house that's close to seven figures, you don't need to put in Gen Air. You don't need to put in the high end KitchenAid or Viking or Wolf. You're never going to get that return. And we're all about thinking about profitability. And the last box you have on here is kitchen cabinets, just a rough number of boxes. And I'm assuming this is not the current boxes, but what you estimate as far as what the finished kitchen will look like as you remove a wall and yes, do whatever. That's exactly right. It's the number of um, kitchen cabinet boxes. And a box is defined by essentially one structure that you put in. Could be a single, could it be a, a double of two drawers that are being opened up? But yeah, what are we putting in, not what are we taking out? Because okay. usually it's definitely very different. Um, either there might be so many different cabinets that you don't really need to put that many in, or most times it's there's not enough cabinetry. And so you don't want to count what you're taking out. You want to make sure and tally up what you're going to put back into the property. So when you go through the kitchen here, we've got one, two, we got six boxes here. How long are we spending in the kitchen typically? You know, maybe 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. K kitchens and bathrooms, you're going to spend a little bit more time on. Um, and and then the rest of the house is a little bit quicker. We'll get to it here in a, in a second on the right side of the the spreadsheet. But that is our fixtures, or excuse me, our um, our uh, major systems. Those are your five areas where you're going to be spending a lot of your money. It's either going to make or break your your project. But yeah, you're spending about ten minutes or so okay. in the kitchen. And then do you want to go down and talk about the master bathroom and go to the right column next? Let's go to the right column okay. next. Um, and, and actually looking through this, the first, and we'll keep actually, let's go down a little bit more so that we can look at our major systems. And for that, that is right here on um, our major systems. Are These are major areas of the house that are going to spend your rehab budget the quickest. So if you've got, we've got, again, kind of that small, medium, and large um, price point of, is there asbestos in the property? That's definitely something you're going to want to take into consideration. Do you have to put in a new furnace? So I want to read these numbers here because asbestos, you've got 1,000, 2,500, 4,000. Is that just based on the size of the property? Correct. Is what you're estimating for the remediation cost? Yes, okay. correct. And, and for asbestos, we typically, not to say that we don't buy homes where you need to do a tremendous amount of um, remediation and tent off the whole property, but we usually... The numbers don't work on those properties. So yeah. thousand to four thousand dollars. These are more uh, called spot remediation. So you've got a professional contractor to come in. Um, typically, it's a person who's got that license to remove it. And let's say you've got duct work. Uh, many houses in the fifties where the duct work was wrapped in what looks like athletic tape. That tape um, or insulation has asbestos in it. You're able to remove the duct work properly, have your contractor dispose of it properly, and it is uh, definitely an expense, but it's not tenting off the whole house and, and spending tens of thousands of dollars just based on the level of rehab that we do. So okay. I always throw that out there that, yeah, you can spend a tremendous amount more on asbestos. These are just kind of your typical projects that we end up getting into because the other ones just haven't worked necessarily. Um, so kind of a caveat. Um, then a furnace would be the 2000 to $4,000 price point. These furnace numbers are, again, typically for us more from a wholesale perspective, and it is gravitating towards 
just replacing the furnace itself in many of our properties, the duct work doesn't have to be reworked. Mm -hmm. You're going to have incremental HVAC cost if either there's no duct work, if it's an unfinished basement, or if you have to do a lot of reconfiguration on it. This is, again, kind of taking out old, inefficient furnace and putting a new, more efficient furnace in the same spot for, for price point. Um, sewer line, you're at $2,500 for more of a spot repair. $6,500 is cracked lines where you're replacing a handful of feet in the sewer line and you're more in the $12,000 range for a full and complete sewer line repair, including the tap. So again, that's a big expense that you want to keep an eye on. Um, electrical panel is typically $2,500 to $3,500 to do a new panel. Panel is either um, in good shape as in the mast is high enough so you don't have to redo the mast and that's the $2,500 expense versus if you have to redo the mast, mm. which has to be four feet off of the top of your roof line, you're adding some extra costs in there. Um, water heaters is either a standard replacement of a 40 gallon or a 50 gallon at $1,300 or we can do tankless for $2,300. Um, do you find you get a, a better return on a tankless? Is that something actually like gives you a noticeable higher sales price? We do when you're looking at houses that are over $500,000. Yeah. The other time we'll use that sometimes is more so to actually save space. So wow. to get a way better layout, I'll actually spend $1,000 more on a tankless hot water heater. Not necessarily that that makes buyers wow, but the layout itself, if you can grab a couple more feet of finished that square feet. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's really where yeah, it's like, you know sense. what? The 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 buyer of a $400,000 house in, in Parker might not get super excited about um, a tankless hot water heater, even though it's a great feature, but more the layout of the property. Yeah. Um, radon, definitely. Um, Colorado has a lot of radon. You know, I'd probably say 80% of our projects that have basements um, typically have radon. And so we put in a mitigation system. So are you guys doing a radon test while you're you know what? under inspection? Or? I actually just assume that I'm going to put it in almost every property. So you're more just doing that preventative. So you have to yes. deal with that on the inspection objection side Correct. when you sell it. I completely okay. agree. Again, we try not to over improve or overspend, but we just know that it's important. I know there's a big debate out there whether radon is harmful, isn't harmful. I just err on the side of caution. I've got three kids myself and, and you know, a kiddo that sleeps in the basement. So I know as a buyer, it's something you're not really going to be able to, to push back on. So just do it, do it up front. Yeah. It's way less expensive when things are being torn up rather than the finished product is out there. So you're anywhere from $1,000 to $1,500 if you have to put in a vapor barrier versus just the system itself. And then we usually leave a line item for updating electrical. If you've got two prong outlets throughout the entire house, you're going to have to not only do the panel, but you're going to have to do um, electrical wiring update. And we do that more on a per square foot of the house. So you actually, when you go from two to three prong, do you actually ground them? Yes. That's one of my pet peeves when we buy sometimes properties from flippers or your mm -hmm. inspection. Like, oh, we replaced all three prongs. You didn't ground them though. Correct. Like, great. You change the faceplate. So it's, it's a pet peeve. We notice all the time when we buy rental properties. It yes. bugs me. So no, completely. I'm glad to hear you. It's worth them. it. Yeah, it's worth it. it. And it's really about, especially as the market gets continually, I think a little more competitive on the finished product you've got to put out there. It's not that much more to do that if you do it in a smart manner. So just yeah. do it, do it up front, do it when the house is opened up and it's, it's way, way more reasonable. Um, so really that's, it's coming up with these big big ticket items because you can look at these first you've inspected the home over 15 minutes and either you'll know because this will typically take up about 50 percent of your rehab budget or all these major systems and you'll either make or break your your project to make sure that it works or not. what's your general cost you know to go to a, a grounded three prong or you say that's per foot or per outlet per square foot per of a property oh yeah okay. you're normally anywhere from for smaller properties that are under a thousand feet you're four or five grand to upgrade all of the electrical repo wiring you know we've done houses that are two thousand to twenty five hundred square feet and we're eight to ten thousand dollars to rewire the entire house oh so you're not just adding the ground you're rewiring yeah we're okay. re, yeah where we we are rewiring on many of our properties which is why it, it dictates kind of its own line item oh, yeah. expense rather than just you know, for example, when we get to bathrooms and bedrooms, the amount that you're fixing up that room includes updating your two prong to three prong and grounding it versus pulling. This is all pulling new wiring. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. 
So then we can probably, you know, that you've got your fixtures and your, or your, excuse me, your um, major systems. And then we can go back over to the left hand side of things. So you've got your kitchen that we've already addressed. Then you go into bathrooms. So we have a separate section for master because it's usually a different price point and a different size than your other bathrooms in the home. And we break it up into four areas. You've got how much you're spending on your vanity. Again, we are almost always ripping out old vanities and putting in new vanities. How much are you spending on your showers? How much are you spending on your pan um, and your tub um, or adding a tub? And then we've got a couple different areas where we, we end up doing some sort of extra to the master bathroom. So you're looking at vanities from the smaller ones that are 18 to 24 inches. We're typically able to, to get those for $500 um, for vanity and install. A 36 inch vanity, you're spending more than a thousand dollar price point for product and labor. And then a double vanity is you're normally in the $1,500 range for putting in a double vanity for again, the product and the labor. Looking at shower walls, you're kind of in that same ballpark of a, a small, medium, or a large. So you're $1,500 for, again, always ripping out the tiling on the wall. Um, typically, this would be waterproofing the um, backer board or the Duro Rock to make sure that it's done properly so you don't have leaks in the future. And then putting up new tiling. And usually, a lot of the older homes, the tiling stops where your six foot um, shower curtain is or whatever. We always tile all the way up to the ceiling. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've got a larger tub, you've just got more surface area to tile. So that price point is seventeen fifty. If you got you have a more large or a kind of a custom shower, you're in the two thousand dollar price point for the tile again, materials and labor for the walls of the of the uh, of the shower, and then for tub, we always a lot of our homes are older and actually have great cast iron tubs in there. They're just a little bit dinged up. So we love to glaze those, um, not only for saving us time, but saving us money. It's also, I try not to fill landfills with yep. giant, you know, amounts of, of fiberglass bathtubs. So we, we glaze them anytime we can. If we are putting in a new bathtub, um, you're getting your Home Depot type of tub, your labor, um, some plumbing costs associated with that. You're more than a thousand dollar price point. And then if you have to put in a custom pan, usually that's a larger shower you're more in that $2,000 price point for, again, material and labor. And then the last thing for our master shower is our three extras are if we are upgrading a toilet, we, we budget, we always replace toilets, but if you need kind of a little bit nicer one, we put a little extra money in there, so 100, 200 bucks. If there's no fan in a bathroom, we always want to put that in, so that's an extra $300. And then a, a little kind of trick of the trade that we do that I think looks nice and saves you time and money is instead of the older 50s and 60s had tile around the walls mm -hmm. in the um, outside of the shower, um, those lovely 50s style homes, even some of the mid-century, obviously you don't want to try to resell a home with tile on the walls that are behind the vanity or behind the toilet. So we demo all that out. Instead of spending time and money to do drywall finish, we'll actually do board and bat which is um, paint quality plywood that's put up four feet around the entire um, bathroom, a three inch trim piece that's that's the top kind of cap, if you will. And then you do one by trim pieces roughly every you know, 12 to 16 inches and it makes it kind of look farmhousey. Yeah, okay. um, and you paint it white and then you paint your walls a different color. So not only is it a nice design feature, but it's actually faster and you're dealing with less imperfections of trying to fix drywall, which is always a pain. And we find that's a, a quick and really well spent five hundred dollar. That makes sense. That's a good idea. Yep. Okay. So um, master bath. Yep. So master bath, and then we can kind of go through. We we have two more sections for bathroom. A lot of the pricing is very similar, but it just helps us on master because we usually end up jotting down a couple of different notes of something different you're going to do. And you're probably spending a few more dollars in the master than you will on the. Yep kids bath potential kids bathroom or the guest bath or something right yes yeah. and this works whether you've got a three-quarter bath um, which is not having a tub and it's a hallway bathroom for the kids to use upstairs versus even let's say a half bath or a powder bathroom as people call it on the main floor when you walk into many properties that are two-story you can use this budgeting where you're only circling you know small vanity of five hundred dollars you're not doing a tub you're not doing shower walls you know, you might put in a fan, but that's a less expensive fix 
than doing larger bathrooms. Um, we typically find that most of our houses are four bedrooms and two or three bathrooms. So we've got enough uh, circling area, if you will, to be able to accommodate for most of the sizes of homes, uh, homes that we inspect. I mean, worst case, you print off page number two mm -hmm. and just bring it with you, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or you can just double up and just, yeah. you know, do tallies and, and say, hey, we've got two bathrooms because usually they're pretty similar. So you kind of go through both bathrooms. You've got so, those two things budgeted. Um, and then we get to the bedrooms. And what we found on that one is it's best to count the number of bedrooms and then write down the square footage because we can figure out how much gonna, it's going to cost if we're not doing any structural changes, if we're more so just doing um, drywall repair texture and painting um, or swapping out those outlets, that's not a huge expense. And we'd rather look at that on a square foot basis than trying to, um, you know, put that money in other spots. So you're just then looking at, okay, I've got four or five bedrooms. I'm telling that up. And then the flooring actually goes in a different section that we'll talk about here in a second. Um, then we find that we've got four other areas that catch most things in a property. There's usually two types of living spaces. So whether it's a dining room or a living room, usually there's an office or another bedroom that we call an office. And then we've got another category. So that probably gets 95% of the style of homes that we're inspecting without completely reinventing the wheel or planning for every scenario. Yeah. And if you got one more room, you just write it in there, right? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Plenty of room for notes. Um, and then keep we keep going down. This, this section's kind of evolved too. We used to try to, and you can if you've, and this is titled basement. So we realized that if it's an unfinished basement, you just want an area to jot down notes and you can figure out your cost based on cost per square foot for putting things in. Or if it's, you know, you go up to your bedroom and your bathroom tally and you'll just write in whether the bedroom's on the main floor or in the basement, or if the bathroom's on the main floor or the basement. Um, we've just found that it's helpful to have kind of a general note area for what else you're gonna do in a basement. Um, so that kind of rounds out, again, kind of the circle type function of you're walking through, you're looking at kitchen, you're looking at beds, you're looking at baths, you're circling your budget numbers. And then let's go up to the top right and we'll go back through more of the tally style. Um, a lot of these are done both on the interior and the exterior of your property. So windows, um, we actually count those from the outside of the property because I think a lot of times you can get in a home and you get turned around and you double count things. Mm -hmm. So again, we broke these up into small windows, medium size windows, large windows, extra large, custom, which is more of like a bay window or definitely something that's you, you know is going to be more expensive and then adding an egress window. And so for these, we can just do tally marks. So if you're a small window, you're $250 these costs are both cost of material and install. Medium is $300, large is $400, extra large is $500, a custom window, bigger at least $1,000, and an egress window is worth $2,500. Um, again, that's pretty good price compared to what I think a lot of other people are, are getting. So you can always take this spreadsheet and adjust it to your level of contractor, yeah. or we're getting ready to, um, we own apartments out of state through a different company, from a rental perspective, but we're trying to scale up and see if we can flip in Cincinnati, Ohio. So we'll be actually taking this document and just recalibrating it for another market. So that's why we did an Excel and people can change to fit their likes. Um, keep kind of going down, count out the number of doors. So you've got interior doors that have a cost, exterior doors, 250 to 500 bucks for an interior and exterior. If you're putting in a sliding glass door going out to, you know, your backyard, you're in a thousand dollar price point. Buy fold doors are usually those closet doors that you're adding that um, fold, you open it up and fold next to each other. Mm -hmm. um, we're big proponents of adding barn doors, not only because I think it looks nice from an aesthetic, but it is a lot less work. It's just hardware and doors that you can order off of Amazon and it is super functional. So we've got a, a area for adding barn doors going down to garage doors, we're able to add a tally mark, whether we're just adding a new opener and the door itself is good, adding a single garage door, which is in a $1,300 price point, or adding a two-car garage door, which is in the $2,000 price point. 
Um, we kind of try to do a good catch all of knowing that areas that would be a hallway or would be outside of a bedroom or a bathroom or a kitchen, you need an area for lighting. So we've got an area for tally marks for adding ceiling lights um, at 250 bucks a pop or adding two can lights. Um, if you're doing a basement and you know you're going to add can lights throughout, um, we've got a price point at $200 for two can lights. Again, this is labor and materials. And you just do your tally marks for how many you're going to put in there. Um, we've got paint. That we didn't have. This is one that's based more on, on kind of experience. We didn't have a dollar amount because paint really does vary pretty widely, but we broke it up into interior and exterior. On average, our interior paints are anywhere from two to four thousand dollars to paint a home, and then the exterior is twenty five hundred to forty five hundred dollars to paint a home. Um, adding the toilets again, if we're doing some upgrades, these are more tally marks. We know that we're gonna um, you know, replace all the toilets in a property, never, almost never worth keeping a toilet. And then this next section is more on square footage. So if we're doing a basement, we're to hang a new sheet of drywall for the labor and materials is about $40 a sheet. So you can look at the square footage of a basement knowing you're going to be doing a lot more drywall work and that needs to be a separate line item. If you're going to then retexture the whole house, we've got a cost per square foot that's anywhere from, you know, four to six dollars per square foot to completely new texture a house. Um, same thing with the trim of adding new baseboards or adding new casing around the doors. It's more of a cost per um, square per linear foot. Um, then you're also looking at adding air conditioning, which is typically a three to four thousand dollar expense. Um, usually, again, it's that the old air conditioner is bad and we're just putting in a new unit, not yeah. completely redoing electrical or all the associated costs that come with that. Roof um, is normally a $4,000 to a $7,500 expense for kind of a small, medium, or a large size roof and the soffit and the fascia work. And that is the, um, you know, fascia is the part that faces you. That's the way I always kind of help remember that. Um, doing gutters, the soffit is the underneath side of it. So if you've got that, that's usually not in the best shape. You've got to allocate some extra funds for that. So you're in the thousand to two thousand dollar range for work on soft and fascia. And then the next um, section is again more on a square foot base for your flooring. So we've got five different sections that encompass all the different types of flooring we'll do in a property. So if you've got hardwood, we're normally in about the seven dollar square foot range for adding new hardwood. If we're going to refinish um, hardwood that is old or, or not too old, not too dated, but just needs a new, um, you know, coat on it and some sanding, it's $4 a square foot. Carpet, you're at 15 bucks a yard. Tile, this definitely can vary a little bit, but we find that we're on average 10 to $12 a square foot for, these are all material and install. And then adding the, uh, the click-in laminate um, or the vinyl, as some people call it, is a really good solution. And we do all these on a cost per square foot. So if you think about it, you've kind of walked through this document. Um, you know, we talked about some of the major systems. And then let's scroll down just a little bit to the very last part. Um, and that is trash removal and then your exterior landscaping. Especially when doing these for condos and townhomes, HOAs might not want a big roll off or a dumpster mm -hmm. sitting in the front. Um, you definitely have to dispose of it properly. So you've got to associate cost either with your contractor removing it or sometimes you are able to put dumpsters in. Usually the cost of a 30-yard roll-off, we're at about $300 for that. Um, so you got to allocate budget, so $500 to $1,500 to get trash out of there. And then landscaping really depends upon being specific for your price point. So minor cleanup, um, taking out a dead tree, cutting some beds, doing some mulch, you know, you're in the $3,000 price point. Um, we jump up to $6,000 for what we call kind of a, a medium landscaping job. So that's more of a single family home that has a, you know, 6250 lot and you're doing some additional work of maybe you're adding a little bit of sod. Maybe you are putting in some bushes or some flowers um, and then a larger yard where you're really either starting from scratch, you've got a big lot we allocate at least $12,000 for that. Um, we also count linear feet for fencing. We're normally at about 20 bucks a linear foot to put in new fencing. 
and then concrete and sprinklers are our last two areas. So if you're busting out an old driveway and putting in new concrete um, or adding a patio, doing kind of regular non-foundational flat work, we're at seven bucks a square foot. Uh, and then sprinklers were usually about on average at $500 per zone. So also really price point specific. You, you know, if you're in a con or a townhome, you don't have to worry about that. Single family homes, if you are in a place where everybody has a pretty nice yard, and you're going to have to, um, you know, grow some grass, you, you got to be adding sprinklers. So it's kind of a big catch all that gets you again, about 95% of the way there for um, correctly budgeting how much it's going to take you to rehab a home. And it's just thinking of, you've got an hour, two hours, and we either need to circle all the different dollar amounts, we need to tally mark this, take that back and then start to build out our, our full budget. Okay, so this was is a mouthful. This is, uh, I mean, very, very detailed, but it's, uh, I like the, you achieve something good here where it's, you know, it's, it's balancing getting the details, but also the, the keep it simple, stupid rules. Yes. And it's kind of balanced. Hey, you get, you get good enough as far as the prices. Yep. Of course you can always get more and more and more, but if you're 95% of the way there, well, that's a couple percent. It's probably not worth another 10 hours to go from 95 to 98% accuracy, at least in my mind. And from what I can see it, I, I can see it walking around. I can see it being a, a great one to two hours and I get you really close to the, to the uh, goalpost. Yeah, it does. And then you, usually we run anywhere from, um, you know, on average about a 10% contingency. So that's really where your catch all is. And, and you hit the nail right on the head where to spend an extra three or four hours in a property or to go through five sheets of budgeting early on, um, that should get caught in your contingency. So yeah. you're right. It, it's not, at least for us, it's not quite worth it. Yeah. Cause you spend five more hours. I mean, there's a cost to your time mm -hmm. or your people's time. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yep. And then just a big general notes section. That's just jotting just anything else all. down. Yeah. Okay. Just to catch all more of kind of a, a, a qualitative thing of um, looking at unique things that might come up that, that you'd need to take into account um, or, general design ideas or just anything else that's this big catch-all because again our goal is to have this kind of on one one sheet of paper so um, you can make it simple and easy to use great um i mean very well laid out you did a good job explaining it uh, I don't have any questions on here. Is there more to talk about? Do we jump on? What's the... Uh, no, I, I I think really that encompasses everything. Again, you can use this for almost any style of project. W just to also classify in case somebody's coming in, our normal sweet spot are condos and townhomes that are usually under $350,000, single family residences that are usually under $600,000. We're not doing super high end. I would not use this this tool to walk through, you know, buying an eight or $900,000 home, having a two or $300,000 rehab budget and putting a $1.3 million, you know, Congress park, Denver square back on the market, you would want to be much more involved. So just kind of that disclaimer and that context of these are the types of houses we're working with. And it worked great for those. You'd want to be a little more involved if you're doing historical homes or much more involved properties. All right, so on to the statement of work. Yeah, let's go to the statement of work. We'll change to, yep, our next spreadsheet. And again, we, we went back and forth and I'll kind of go through this one um, a little bit quicker because what this statement of work is, is, is taking all of your notes that we just did from a budget perspective, it's putting them on more of a line item basis because that's how a lot of our contractors think is they're not worried in the front of how many lights they're putting in a property they're thinking of how much electrical do i have to do and how much is it going to cost yeah so we have on average um i'm going to take the the yep. wheel and drive here for just a Grab for just a, a second and um just go you know we're at on average 35 line items um some area for change orders so five or six change orders and then we scroll down to our materials list so we have another 30 line items for materials. So again, this is more for the condo and the townhome that we want it all on one page. We want it succinct. And I'll walk through the way to look at it. This is for- uh, an, well, Sorry, let me just uh, clarify here. So yeah. this, is, this is, hey, once you do your, um, your budgeting sheet, you come back to the office. Yep. And then this is something you're doing 
at your computer, Correct. not on the job site, right? Correct. Okay. That's a great point. We are doing this at our computer. We are putting this budget together so that we can then, the next step in the process is meeting with your contractors. You've hopefully narrowed it down to two or three people that you think are going to be a good fit for this style of project and actually really, really focusing on what we call our push pricing method, which is we literally push or give them a piece of paper and say, hey, this is going to help you cut down the amount of notes you're going to take. This gives you a vision for what we want to do for the project. This gives you a budget range. Let's walk through and either come up with a game plan of things we might want to add to the project or cut back in certain areas to work within our budget. Or we might be a little bit high on electrical, but low on plumbing based on their specific opinion. It just helps consolidate this so that the step in the process is you get to this area and you're able to come to an agreement on the budget and then sign a contract with them and again, get ready to go the second that you actually close on the project. So that kind of helps put it in, into, into context. And we break things up to where the cost for the majority of our contractor items are primarily labor only. The only materials that we want them to pay for are um, their tools, their saw blades, you know, screws, drywall, mud, things like that. I want to pay for everything else for two reasons. One, I don't want to pay a markup. And two, we're able to control costs better and really keep our eyes on how much are we spending on materials. And then three is we put it all on our cr company credit card and we get points for it and we want to go on vacation at the end of the year or do employee bonuses or put more money towards our marketing budget. Um, the practicality of this is it actually helps contractors so they don't have to float on average an extra, you know, 15 to $25,000 in materials. And they like that. And they like having to float. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, it truly is a win-win, I think, of they know that their draws go solely to them and their labor. And I think it really, really helps us. And it's just something that we've evolved over time. Um, and so this is a specific budget that we're doing on a townhome right now in Lafayette that we're working on as we speak. So these are 100% kind of live numbers, but also work for training purposes. And so this first section here, you've got demo, trash haul, haul framing, ship lap yep. door, sliding glass door. This is mostly just the labor and mm -hmm. then the basic, you know, cost doing business to the contractors. Correct. Like saw blades and yep. all that stuff. Okay. Yep. They, exactly. And there are these notes on the right hand side. Are these notes that you're putting in here as mm -hmm. uh, instructions? So that way, hey, when you say, you know, what's one here? Plumbing. Uh, you guys know, hey, the plumbing is for the kitchen faucet and replacing the uh, garbage disposal. Yep. And that way we're just kind of on the same page. Exactly. Again, we kind of had more elaborate and exotic ways to do this and we just found it almost became too cumbersome. So what we do is we've got, what is the area that they're focusing on? So for us, the first one is demo. The next uh, column over is the labor of who's doing it. So it's either the GC or a subcontractor. So everybody's on the same page of who's doing that specific area. If there's anybody that's paying for the materials, so this is a good example. On demo, if they've got trash bags and, and saw blades and whatever else for their saws, all I'm not paying for that. I don't want to have to forecast that to me. That's kind of that cost of doing business. Um, so it's on them. The budget is how much we've allocated to pay for that specific area. And um, we have a tab for how much we're actually spending too, so that we share this with our contractor and then we keep track of the actuals to compare what did we estimate versus how much are we actually spending. And then like you mentioned, our last column is um, just the notes of, hey, here's exactly what's going on. Where is that happening in a specific part of the house? Um, really helps so that there's no gray area of, well, you guys gave me this, you know, demo number of $700, but you actually didn't include, let's say, uh, demoing a concrete pad in the back. You know what, contractor, you're right, we didn't. So let's do a change order and let's add to it. Or I don't remember talking about that. We actually have in the notes, it's okay, Mr. Contractor. We actually did and it's right here in the notes. We're yeah. good, right? Oh yes, you know what, you're right. So it helps both of us. It's not just for the investor, it's for the contractor as well. Hey, communication makes a good relationship. Yeah. I mean, it really, really does. So um, without being kind of overly complicated, it's really just going to straight down the list from 
um, a progressive standpoint of demo, hauling off the trash. Then we're going to get into framing. Are we doing shiplap on a specific product um, or part of the project? Doors, windows, cabinets. So we kind of go straight down the line. And again, this, um, you know, about 30 row um, quantity gets us everything that we're going to be doing in a condo or townhome. The next column over is who's doing it and then who's paying for the materials, how much is that specific dollar amount, and we get down to change orders. So in this project in particular, we've had four change orders. So our starting budget was um, you know, in the high $13,000 range, and we've had four change orders for an extra $1,000. And it, these change orders could be things that you discover and say, oh shoot, we've got to do this, or it could be decisions that you make. So a good example is our first change order is we decided to put some, you know, we had some very, very minor cracks in the, it's a, a townhome, so it has just a little patio at back, no yard or anything. Mm -hmm. um, kind of looked at the comps, we're on track for the rest of our budget. So we said, you know what, let's repair those little um, spider type of cracks and let's actually skim coat it and let's do some stamped concrete so it's a nice finished product. That cost us an extra $650, was kind of an optional one, but an additional cost versus let's say we we decided to change the placement on two of our lights in the bathrooms um, because it just, we got the product done and it just didn't look great. So that's one where you're not super pumped, but for $290 to have a really good finished product that looks better, made sense for us to do. So again, you account for all your change orders. And then the last section for us is what are we spending on our fixtures and finishes and our materials? So on average, it's another, you know, 25 line items from tile, vanities, your doors, the hardware for your cabinets, the paint, the shiplap, toilets, appliances. Again, every single thing that we're putting into this property needs to be budgeted and accounted for. And we have little notes of where things are going. Um, good example is, is if we're putting in flooring, and the contractor says, well, I didn't think we were going to do that in the bathroom. We have in our notes, um, no, we ha we said we were going to do 500 square feet of this laminate LVT product. And so you can tally that up and say, you know what, you're right, we're on the same page. And then you got your total. And um, again, this is your, your budget and your statement of work on a straightforward condo. So you've got everything in one place and this gets attached to your contract. Sign that and you're ready to, to jump in and start the project. And then so at the end of the project, you've got your estimated and that next column over, I guess that's column F on your spreadsheet here, your yep. actuals. And that's always yep. good for just, you know, uh, post game uh, recap, right? Yeah. Figure, hey, what, what do we do well? What do we need to refine? And yep. what do we do on the next flip? Yeah. And and I wanted to include this. I went back and, and I looked at what was our one page budget total when we did all of our circling and our tally marks and from and the previous spreadsheet from the previous spreadsheet that we just went over on this specific project we were at twenty two thousand six hundred eighty five dollars for a 1500 square foot townhome where we're at right now um and that doesn't include our contingency which on this one was ten percent we from a couple of the either change orders that we had to do or a couple changes that we decided to make as of right now and we've got two weeks to go on the project we're at twenty four thousand six hundred thirty three dollars so we're right on track. You're within that exactly that 10% contingency yeah. then. Yep. Again, if if we had to spend in one area um, and we didn't have to another, we could have cut out, you know, about a thousand dollars. But for us, I think it makes all the sense in the world to do certain things. But it, I really wanted to demonstrate to the listeners how close are we. And so yeah, then you look at that that estimating spreadsheet. I always track what did we think it was going to be and then what is it so we can improve on every project. No, well, this is great. Um and I know the previous spreadsheet rehab plan people can grab. Is this something you're sharing as well, or is this? Well, so for this one, we'll want to talk to clients individually okay. because there's a, we'll talk about it in our next episode, okay. is a much more involved statement of work. So this starts to get into 
um, those things that we can give somebody a tool, but if they're not knowing how to use it or using it right, it's almost like let's help us, you know, yeah. coach them through it. But anybody can use that budgeting tool. So we're happy to to share that one. But this one and the one we'll dive into next week are are pretty specific. And I'm sure people could figure it out, but that's something we'll definitely share more on a one-on-one basis where we can help people. Perfect. Well, if you guys want to grab that first spreadsheet on the uh, circle, your budgeting spreadsheet, mm -hmm. or I don't know that's the official yeah. name of it, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, check the show notes. There'll be a link there to go download it, or you can always email me or Derek and we can email you a copy as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Anything else we need to cover? Because I know for here, we're planning on covering these two spreadsheets, right? And yep. we're going to do a single family, more in depth statement of work on the next episode. Yes. Yeah. And that's a room by room statement of work. So for kind of time's sake too, oh. we thought we'd save that for the next one of single family home where you really are doing different things in every single room. And th this, you're really doing the same base throughout everywhere. You're doing the same casing throughout everywhere, the same paint color schemes, things that truly translate to the whole property versus single family and larger homes that are more expensive and more involved. It's a room by room or tab by tab statement of work that we'll dive into in the next episode. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Um, I have no other questions on here. Any final words of wisdom or cells on the spreadsheet that we need to discuss? No, I think all that, I mean, people are probably spreadsheet overload. No, um, we love this stuff. But it, it really was, it's interesting how we were much more over analyzing when we first started. This used to be a four or five page document, but it really evolved into the practicality of what's a usable tool? What gets you 95% of the way there? You've got your contingency budget. What can we teach other clients and how to use this effectively? And for me, how can I stat use this with my staff? Because I have two other people that are now doing this when I did everything on my own. And really full circle is how can we update this and use it in other markets? So for us, it just actually was great to get it down to one page for budgeting, one page for condo and townhome statement of work, and then a little more involved for other bigger projects. Yeah, going back a few sentences there, you said just talking about how like when you first start out, you're just, you know, very, very detailed and way more analytical. Um, again, I've not scaled the flipping business, but in other projects and businesses I've done, I've always gone through the same evolution. Yeah. When you're on like the newer side, just beginning experience, it's like, oh my gosh, I get every detail, every I dotted, every T crossed, every decimal figured out. Yep. Um, and then when you get into it, you're like, you know what? It's not that big of a deal. And it's, in my mind, it always comes back to the KISS principle and the 80-20 rule. Yep. Where can we keep it simple? And where are the main things that are going to make up, you know, the 80% worth of the work, the budget, all that stuff? And there's a couple of details that aren't, yeah, we don't need to stress about those. And it's interesting to see this because I've, that's been my same evolution in every project I've ever done is like get really complicated. Then the more advanced you get, the more successful you get, Yeah. the simpler you get. Yeah. I noticed that pattern with just other business owners and just other successful investors. So it's really interesting that you, you made that comment. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think that it's almost you, you try to prove your intelligence and worth of how complicated <laughs> a spreadsheet can you do. And I probably brought my Wall Street background to that and, and over analyzed it. But now it's being kind of proud of how functional and how efficient can we be? Yeah. And can we use this on evaluating five properties at once or having two or three staff members do it to grow your business or doing it in another market that's saying, oh, man, look at this, you know, 17 tab, you, you know, insane spreadsheet that one thing goes off and you're spending hours trying to fix it. It's yeah. like, that doesn't help you run a business. Now it's about bragging about simplicity. Yes, it is. Um, I know. I believe that, that's in my mind. I um, agree. Cool, Derek. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this, this was a great episode. So uh, everyone out there, make sure you catch the next episode as we'll build upon this one, um, going into a more detailed statement of work on a single family home. So Derek, yeah. thank you. And everyone out there, thank you for listening. Thanks, Chris.